Hi all, thank you for coming to today's event featuring award-winning journalists, Andrea Bernstein and Kelly McEvers. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 25th season. Andrea Bernstein's book, American Oligarchs, the Kushners, the Trumps, and the Marriage of Money and Power. Wait, can you see it? Where is it? Oh, can't see. There it is. Um, <laughs> is a most enlightening telling of the origin stories of two families who reached the pinnacle of American power. Bernstein's book is utterly seductive from the get-go. If you think you couldn't know one more crazy fact about the Trump family, let me set the record straight. There's always more. The Kushner material is mesmerizing. Here we meet them as immigrants working hard, that sort of nice stuff that we've heard about every family that ever come, came here. <laughs> Wildly interesting drama too. So much payoff, so much corruption from both families, my head spins. So much strong arming, so much slipping through potential handcuffs that seemed ever so close. So much vengeance and saber rattling in both dynasties, it feels epic. Bernstein fills in details that help us to understand who and what these families are. Epic. I'm telling you, I love this book. If you have questions for Andrea Bernstein or Kelly, please email them to reservations at writersblockpresents.com and we'll try to address them. You've heard Kelly McEvers as she filled us in about the news each day. Kelly is the award-winning former host of NPR's All Things Considered and is now the host of Consider This, an NPR podcast that goes beyond the headlines to provide more depth and context to the news. Kelly will guide Andrea Bernstein through her reporting on the Kushner and Trump families through America's, uh, through Andrea's analysis of how these families got to where they are and what they did to achieve their success. I urge you to visit our website, writersblockpresents.com. You'll find a link to the bookstore to purchase a copy of Andrea's great book, American Oligarchs. There's everything in here, prostitutes, revenge, intimidation, corruption, very painful arm twisting. It's all here. Who could ask for more? And if you like programs like this, please consider making a tax deductible gift to Writer's Block to keep our events going. Do I sound like NPR? I think I do. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Andrea Bernstein and Kelly McEvers. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrea. Both Thank you Andrew. so much, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations on the paperback publication of this book. As we were just saying earlier, uh, we wish that we were doing this in person and we all wish that we were always doing everything in person, but here we are. Um, and so I kind of just feel like I'm gonna dive right in and start peppering you with questions. I hope that's okay. And the first one is just, um, you know, you're in radio, I'm in radio. Um, and I wonder what made you want to write a book. I mean, I, I think it's important for people to know that you do a podcast called Trump Inc. I, how many episodes at this point have you guys? Oh my heard? gosh, <laughs> I, I can't even, hundreds probably. Yeah, I mean, it's this so. incredible ongoing document where you guys are investigating all that there is to investigate about this administration. And so, right, you're making a podcast, you're doing radio for WNYC. Why, why a book? What made you wanna, what made you wanna do a book? So, so glad you ask. <laughs> and also thank you to Writer's Block and also big thrill for me to be on with Kelly who has done her own fabulous work on Trump's business herself. So thank you. Um, so I have been writing, wanting to write a book for a long time to sort of um, it kind of, you know, satisfy the same itch that makes us want to do long form, makes us want to do podcasts rather than, you know, short four minute features. Uh, which is you really want to tell a story, you really want to develop the characters. And that is what I wanted to do. And um, the, the, or, the uh, origin story of American oligarchs is that um, I had actually been thinking about writing a book on the Bridgegate scandal, which was a big scandal involving Chris Christie in New Jersey, in which his aides shut down lanes of the world's busiest big bridge, the George Washington Bridge, um, to punish someone who had a Democratic mayor who had not endorsed Christie for re-election. That was a very big corruption scandal at the time. Yes. I know in like the crazy that we're in. It seems, it like, seems okay, like now it's like, day, right? That would be yeah. an afternoon. Uh, but it was a very big event in, in New York and New Jersey. 
And I covered it from beginning to end. And I was like, I really want to write a book. I know all the characters. I want to tell the whole story rather than just little bits of it. So I wrote a book proposal and I sent it out in the fall of 2016. And people's attention span was already on Trump and like everybody's like, oh, Bridgegate, like, things, you know, whatever. And about a year later, or maybe I guess about six, nine months after that, I got an email from an editor saying, let's have lunch. And I was like, okay, great. And I was working on a story and then he was working on something. And then four months later, I realized, oh, I never met with that editor. And he said, I really like your proposal on Bridgegate. Why don't you write a book on the Kushners and the Trumps instead, same people. And <laughs> I thought about it and I said, you know, you are right. It is in fact, the same people who are involved. It is the Trumps, the Kushners, the sort of corrupt real estate and political landscape of New York and New Jersey. And I didn't actually realize that how many people that I was going to know once I started to report this book that actually had firsthand knowledge of the events. Uh, but that is what happened. And I thought about it for a while and I said, yes, okay, well, this means I'm gonna be immersing myself in this all the time, which was true. Uh, and uh, writing a book is sort of like, got up every morning at six and I would work until nine and then the next day the same thing. And I would try not to do screens after nine so I wouldn't be totally insane. Uh, and this is in addition um, to your day job, we should be here. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I did take some time off to do it, but yes, basically. And, um, and the thing about um, the book that I sort of really figured out kind of midway through is I really, because I read all the Trump books, I read about a hundred Trump books and most of them were not very good reads. I was like, I wanna write a book that has characters, that has acts, it has five acts, yeah. that has um, a story to tell that people are gonna to wanna to read as a story, that it's not just because they're gonna to wanna to be edified, but actually it's going to be, I hope, something that people want to read. And that was what I was hoping to do with American oligarchs. Nice. And one of the interesting things that you do from the very beginning is you sort of set it in this, you set it in the context, right, of this thing that I think some people like to call the new gilded age, right? We're in this time when inequality is almost unimaginable. Like the inequality in our society is just so um, vast. And one of the interesting things you say is that, you know, the Gilded Age, one thing about it is that it ended, you know, this thing yeah. that we're in, this time that we're in, and you sort of situated in these people, the Trumps and the Kushners, and we're going to get deep into their stories, but you situated them in this moment, right, of just like, the uber wealthy, getting wealthier, finding ways to stay wealthy, right? And the time, frankly, of corruption, yeah? Yeah, well, yes. And, and one of the things that the book I hope is about is not just the story of these two families, but of us as a democracy and how we did not defend ourselves as a democracy against this growing inequality. And, you know, I think that sometimes it's sort of hard to conceptualize, but growing inequality and less democracy are completely related. And it's happened before in American history and it's happening now because when there is more inequality and there are richer and richer people, they want to do things to preserve their wealth. And one of the things they do is pay for the politics that they want. And that is something we saw in the Gilded Age, the first Gilded Age, and it's something that we see now, more and more money flowing into our political system from we don't know where. Yeah. And Trump has sort of added an extra piece of that because right. money can flow in directly through paying him, which is a totally new wrinkle. Right. And that is the story that I wanted to tell about how American society goes from uh, these moments of more oligarchy and more corruption to less. And we're definitely in a period of height, but we have figured out ways to get out of it in the past. Right. Um, and I'm just so glad you said it in that context. I think it's really important to understand the story in that way. Um, I barely dipped my toe into Trump reporting. I mean, again, you guys on um, Trump Inc., this incredible podcast on WNYC every single day, and obviously with this book have done so much. And one of the things that just literally blew me away when I finally got my hands on your book was how much incredible reporting you did on the Kushner family. Yeah. And I was wondering if you, I mean, it's an unbelievable story. Um, many There's many chapters of the story of the Kushner family, but 
the story of them in Poland and how they survived the Holocaust is yeah. one of the most um, absolutely compelling stories. And again, I think maybe some of us knew the very broad strokes. And even as a reporter, I knew a few more, but you really dug deep and you got some really good stuff. So I wonder if you would just sure tell us the story. I mean, so when I started to work on the book, I was telling somebody the story of Jared Kushner's grandmother, which I will outline in a minute. And somebody said to me, is that a true story? And I was like, what, it wouldn't be a true story? And they said, oh no, a lot of times Holocaust survivors would make things up. So it wasn't that I doubted her story, but it made me feel sure. like I have to report that, like I'm gonna report out everything else. That's right, yeah. And one of the things that was so interesting about the Holocaust was that in the 1980s, so we're thinking, you know, 40 years after the war, 30, 40 years after the war, uh, a lot of survivors really began for the first time to tell their stories. And there were all of these projects to record these oral testimonies. So Jared Kushner's grandmother, Ray Kushner, gave two testimonies. Uh, her sister gave a testimony. And I got in touch with the Holocaust Museum. And I said, who else has been through the experience in this town? And I listened to all of their testimonies. And um, most of them were not transcribed, but, you know, because you learn radio, you know. <laughs> it's like I listened and listened and listened because that's how you really understand the story. Sure. And there were other sources too. I mean, for example, the movie Defiance was based on a book Defiance in which Nahama Tech, uh, who is a, a writer from the US had gone and collected a lot of histories of people of the Polish partisans who had lived uh, sort of in the forest uh, and were basically an armed resistance to the Nazis. So what happened is that Jared Kushner's grandmother, Ray Kushner, was sort of a kind of from an upper middle class family in this town called Novogrudik, which was um, really had a very rich Jewish cultural life. And there were tens of thousands of Jews in the area. And the first thing that happens to them is there's the partition of Poland and the Soviets come in and they're thinking, OK, well, maybe that's not so bad because at least they're not the Nazis. The Soviets were not good, but then the Nazis do march in. And at first they think, okay, it's all right because they're making us walk in the streets, not the sidewalks and wear yellow stars, but we can still live our lives. And slowly, slowly, slowly that constricts. And there's a massacre of 50 people on the town square, but the rest of the Jews think, oh, maybe there was a reason. Maybe those Jews did something wrong and we haven't done anything wrong, so we're gonna be okay. But as time goes on, things get worse and worse and worse. There's a mass roundup in the courtyard and Jared Kushner's great grandmother says to her two daughters, run in opposite directions because then maybe one of you will survive. Oh God. One of them, his, his mother's older sister, Esther, does not survive. But Ray makes it and more and more people are dying. Her mother gets shot. Sort of as the Nazis decide people are expendable, they get killed. And by the summer of 1943, there's only 300 or so of them left out of thousands. And they realize actually they're going to die unless they get out. So they dig a tunnel and they, at night using spoons or bits of wood, dig out the dirt and they put it in bags and hide the bags in the walls. And um, the dirt that comes back in the book in this very pivotal moment, yes. they hide the dirt, they hide it. And they build this tunnel and it's about, it's about the length of two football fields and about two feet wide and they crawl through one person by one person. All of them get out. And Jared Kushner's grandmother and her sister and their father escape to the forest. And they get to the forest and they live among the partisans for nine months. After the war, they come back and their town has been destroyed, a wasteland. And they, they eventually disguise themselves uh, as Greeks and board a train and get out of Poland and begin this odyssey to eventually to Italy, which involves illegal border crossings and they get to a refugee camp. And when they get to the refugee camp, they're stuck because at this time, the US laws are very restrictive against Jews. And after a while, they figure out that if they change up their names and lie about their country of origin and Jared Kushner's grandfather who was born Yussel Berkowitz, 
takes on a new identity, which is as his father-in-law's son, that is Jared Kushner's grandmother's father's son. So they switch and they pretend that she was the daughter-in-law because that was the only way they could get in. And yeah. they- So he takes the name Kushner, even though it's his wife's he, name. Right. Yeah. He takes the name Kushner. He becomes, yeah. Yussel Berkowitz becomes Joe Kushner. And because everything has been lost to them, there are no documents to say right. otherwise. Right. And they get on a boat and they arrive in the New York Harbor with $2 in their pocket. They're helped by the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And very quickly, Joe Kushner gets a job as a carpenter. And eventually, he's a very frugal guy. He sometimes will sleep on construction sites so he doesn't have to pay for the bus fare home. And in about five years, they have enough money to buy a small plot of land in New Jersey. And that's how they start their real estate empire. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible story. And of course, the reason it's incredible, I mean, you used phrases like illegal border crossing. Yeah. Refugees. You know, I mean, it's just hard, I think, for people to hear that and to hear that, to know that this is, this family's, and it's it's not just like a story that they, this family like represses and never talks about. Like they, you know, this right. is important to them, right? This is something, I mean, I think some families you know, you kind of just don't talk about it anymore. But this family is something they talk about a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the contradictions of the families be, of the family because they never believe in playing by the rules, and they believe that because they flouted the Nazis, no authority figures, no rules should apply to them. So right. it's this incredible contradiction, and you know, I think that we do see this among Holocaust survivors is that there's a sort of group that is um, believes that okay so we can't let what happened to us happen to them and then there are people who believe we can't let them come get us yeah. and they want to build walls and they want to keep people away and that is a strain of thinking and that was something that I really had to think a lot about in writing the book because I think that I assumed okay if you had that experience you'd be welcoming to all refugees automatically right. You should. But but no, there is another line of thinking of sort of, yeah. I need to do what I need to do to protect myself and my right. family. And mine, my own. So, and you, and and you yes. can't, yeah, you can't fault anyone for having that thought. And it's very interesting because when you hear Ivanka Trump speak, now her um, children are Ray and Joe Kushner's great grandchildren. One of her sons is also named Joe Kushner. And when she tells the story, she rewrites it. So she says, you know, my family played by the rules, but they actually didn't play by the rules. Yeah. And, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but mm -hmm. isn't there a split in the family even now about how to think about this story? And how to Oh, think yes. It? Yes, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I mean, one of the things that I sort of tell people at the beginning is that this is not a story of inevit inevitability. This is, this is a story of... Uh, symbolic families, but not typical families, that they made choices. They made specific choices to get where they are. And I mean, there was a big split in Jared Kushner's family, but his cousins have gone on to do different things, have gone on to do public works. And uh, he has a cousin that works uh, with refugees. So it's not that you had to end up that way. That's but right. it was that Jared Kushner specifically made choices about who he was going to be. Right. Um, and then there's another immigrant family mm -hmm. that came from mm -hmm. Germany, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the Trumps. Although one really surprising thing from your book that I didn't know, that's um, as Andrea said in her introduction, she's so right. Like just when you think you know everything, you don't know everything. There's always more to know. Was that they often said they were from Sweden, even though they're from Germany, oh, the Trump yeah. family. Like, yes. and it continued into, like, I was, I'm like late in your book and I'm like, they're still saying it. Yes, they're you still know? saying they're at the funeral. At Fred Trump's, at yeah. Fred Trump's funeral, that's Donald Trump's father. Yeah. So they were from uh, Friedrich Trump, that's Donald Trump's grandfather, was from this area in Germany called Kalsta. And he had a very, he was not the oldest son. He had a very small piece of inheritance. And plus he didn't want to fight in the war. So he got on a boat and he got to New York and he had some family there and he said, fiddled around in New York for a while, but he realized where the money was to be made was out West. So he went out first to Seattle, then he went uh, to the Northwest, the last American, North American gold rush. He was in the hospitality business. So he wasn't a miner. He was catering to the needs of miners who were interested in food 
and alcohol and sex. And that is basically what Friedrich Trump provided. And he, a lot of people lost money. Most people lost money, but he made money and he came back to New York with a pretty big nest egg and bequeathed it to his son, Fred, who eventually began the Trump family real estate business. And that is the origins of the business. During World War II, now Fred Trump had spoken German at home and lived in a, that's Donald Trump's father, right. uh, spoke with a German accent and uh, really lived in this German enclave for quite some time in Queens. But, but during World War II, it became obviously a bad business situation to be German. So that's when they started to say that they were Swedish. And um, they really propagated that myth that they were Swedish. And this was sort of, I mean, I don't think this will be a big surprise to most people, but this is Donald Trump. Whatever he has to say to yeah. promote his family's interests, he will say. But that, so, that was happening before he was even born. I mean, we should say his mother is from Scotland, but still, that's also not- Also an immigrant. That's not Sweden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. also his mother- Also his mother, an immigrant. And his grandmother and his grandfather were all immigrants. Right. And that she was, I didn't realize yeah. that his mother had worked. And two of his wives. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> two of his wives, two of the three. Um, but his, that his mother had worked as a maid um, for a wealthy family. For I Carnegie, think. yes. Yeah. For yes. not any wealthy family, for yes. Carnegie, for crying yes. out loud, to like live yes. this life. There's just all these threads that are just so fascinating. Mm. Um, but yeah, this idea that like from the very beginning, um, the family, you, you're born into a world where like lying about who you are as a way to do business is just sort of yes. baked in to, to, to your whole existence. That plus another surprising thing I learned from your book was um, the fact that the way, without getting too complicated, because I'm sure I can't do it, I know you can explain it, but the way Fred would sort of move money around and put this and yes. this ownership and this and this ownership, when the children were born, they were already rich because there were things in their names, right? Donald Trump was born, mm -hmm. literally born yes. wealthy. Yeah, explain it was that. Literally, he was literally born wealthy. So this is a really interesting moment in history when Fred Trump was really securing his business. And there's resonances, we just learned even more resonances last week or whenever it was that we saw Trump's tax returns. Maybe it was two weeks ago, I've lost track. But anyway, Fred what Trump <laughs> has, there are two huge uh, pillars of Fred Trump's success. One is, is that he figured out that in order to be successful, he had to have the right political connections. So he gets a receivership, the ability to control a, a, fi a mortgage financing co uh, company because he learns that he has to cozy up to the Brooklyn Democratic Organization, which controls the judges who are going to be able to give out these big packages. So he gets this big package and he gets this mortgage information and he starts to use this information as a basis to uh, make loans and build buildings. The second big break he gets is he learns how to apply that to the Federal Housing Administration, which is guaranteeing all kinds of loans. And because Fred Trump knows how to work his connections, he gets an outsized portion of loans. So there's a, there's a certain quantity of loans to go around. If the Trumps are getting more, other developers are getting less. And it becomes clear that Fred Trump is futzing around with the valuations. So when he wants money from the HFA, the FHA, he says that his property is worth a certain value. When he has to pay the taxes, he says it's worth five times less. And then he does these tricks where he uh, bequeaths the land to his children, Donald and his siblings. Uh, so he's then I don't own the land. So then I have to lease the land and more money has to come in from the federal government. He's cetera, leasing it from his children. From children. Yeah. Right. Right. They're right. his landlords. At one point they're his landlords and his mortgagers uh, and his managers. Uh, and he does all of this to avoid paying taxes. Yeah. And what's so extraordinary is at this moment in history when Donald was, you know, Donald was this sort of, um, he's what's called this faux firstborn, which is a child that was born right after the war. So he wasn't the oldest, but he was the one who was born right after the war. So sort of the most important. And he, um, so in that era, in the 1950s, 1940s, people, Americans still believed in paying taxes. Roosevelt during the war said, uh, paying taxes is the price of membership in a civilized society. 
and people supported it. Very, very rich people paid maybe three quarters of their income, even more. At one point, it was 94% of your income over a certain amount would be taxed. Wow. And, and people believed in that. People believed there shouldn't be big inequality. They believed you should be able to make money, but only so much money. And then the rest should go back to society. And that was the ethos at the time that Fred Trump, Fred Trump was cheating. He was sort of an early adopter tax avoider. Yeah. And he, Why do you think that is? Like, what is it that made him an outlier from the rest of the ways? It that? was sort of the family ethos that, uh, you know, and I think we see it in, in Donald Trump. Remember, in the tax story, it came out that he had held up a big refund that he'd gotten. He'd said, look, the IRS is so stupid for giving me money back. So it was a way of sort of cheating the system, beating the system, yeah. but it was a really, you know, uh, a value that was passed on from generation to generation that taxes are for other people. Yep. And trying to take from the government in terms of they're gonna guarantee loans, they're going to build infrastructure that will help us make money. But when it comes to giving back, too bad. And you know, we really see that with a president, a president of the United States, a you know, purported billionaire who is obviously not one not because a companies keep losing money who pays $750 in taxes. So it's going on to this day. Right. So we're really starting to see the building blocks of these families, right? I mean, just some of these kind of core values that, again, these people are being kind of born into before they even get started. And then, of course, a lot of us know the story of Trump, the playboy, the guy in the 80s riding around and the fancy cars. What was his... Um, you know, what was his actual business like then? What was he like as a quote unquote businessman in this time when he was supposedly so successful? Well, so there were a few different eras. I mean, there was the era where he sort of managed his father's kind of modest apartments in the outer boroughs of New York City. But he got the idea from the, his 20s that he wanted to be in Manhattan. And there's a story about how which he tells himself, he wanted to renovate a hotel that was next to Grand Central Terminal. And uh, he didn't have financing and he didn't have state approvals, but he told the state that he had the financing and he told the bank that he had the state approvals, none of which he had, uh, and got the biggest tax break in the history of the city of New York through his family connections to Abe Beam, who was the mayor then. And, there's an anecdote about how this developer is thinking about doing a deal with him. And he says, well, I'll have to meet the mayor. And Donald Trump says, fine. And he says, what time do you want to do? And he says, okay, two o'clock. Donald Trump says, fine. He doesn't call the mayor. He picks him up. They go to city hall, two o'clock. The mayor puts his arm, one arm around Donald, one arm around Fred and says, anything they want, they get. And I actually counted it up recently. What they got, and it just ended this past April, was a tax abatement just for that property that has cost the city taxpayers $400 million. So that is a $400 million gift to this property. And that was sort of Donald Trump's first big deal in Manhattan, which he got based on, you know, getting through his political connections. Right. He got it based on lying. And then he boasted. He boasted about the fact that he had lied about the approvals and the bank financing uh, in his book, I think it was The Art of the Comeback, one of his books. The and Art of the, which he, is one of the art of. Art of the Comebacks, yes. <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of those he boasts about the fact that he has lied about uh, to get this approval. So that was Donald Trump. On the other hand, at the time, he was actually building things. And uh, he was building buildings. He actually had a product. And that right. very quickly, by the time this sort of, you know, Playboy phase that you were describing, right. he was building failing casinos, right. which were, you know, taking more taxpayer money, yeah. uh, more, more, you know, money from the community, and you know, then it all crashed. Right. And that, and he really, other than an infusion of cash from The Apprentice, was never able to put his business back together again. Right. And then, of course, the the story he told in The Apprentice was, mm -hmm. I, I was down and out, yes. but like. I made a comeback, <laughs> wasn't true. And it only became true because of nice. the apprentice. I mean, it's just so Trumpian. Right. You know, I feel like I wanna, I have to mention someone who you mentioned in your book who did so much great reporting on Trump at that time. Um, and we all miss him so much is Wayne Barrett, longtime yeah. reporter, you know, who did books on Trump. I love the stories of 
him he's be, he's been blacklisted from Trump's casino and yet he shows up anyway and at some point um you know a Trump's henchmen like it's some security guards who are also you know cops by day they take him down to the jail in like a bloody cell and try to rough him up I mean this is the kind of behavior that um reporters who covered him faced all the time not to mention yeah. the lawsuits you know just the constant like punitive behavior and yet somehow Wayne Barrett you know this wonderful New York journalist um persisted I guess my question for you is do you feel like he was on to Trump before everyone else it's un it is uncanny so um I did a, a sort of podcast excerpt of the book and I found in the WNYC archives a 1992 interview that Wayne Barrett had given with WNYC when he wrote his first book about Trump. And he had him down. He, I mean, the things that he said to describe Trump uh, from the business shenanigans to the, his personal lifestyle could happen today. I mean, here's one example. He describes him as staying up all night, watching TV at 3 a.m., crankily t changing the channel and eating cheeseburgers. So this was in 1992. Right. I mean, it's like he's still doing that. He probably did that last night. He's probably going to do it tonight. So he really, I mean, the thing that Wayne understood about Trump before most people is that Trump wasn't about business and flashiness and gloss. He was about corruption. He was about rigging deals. Yeah. He was about controlling the New York uh, political infrastructure and then the New Jersey political infrastructure and about creating a sense of obligation. As a matter of fact, the book opens with the wedding of Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. And it is this moment among other things for Donald Trump to assert his authority over the New York political media and real estate world. And all these people are coming on helicopters. Yeah. Rupert Murdoch's daughters are the flower girls. The New York attorney general is there for governors are there. Yeah. And Donald Trump himself, he boasted in, in the 2016 campaign about he would invite people to things and then they would have to do something for him. So it was right. very clear that that is how he views the world. And when he became, when he went to the White House, it was very clear that that was the kind of president he was going to be because that was how he understood the world from being a private business person. That's, just how, that's how he's done life for seven decades. Yeah, I mean, why, why change it now? Just because you're the president. Um, I feel like we should go back to the Kushners a little bit too and just sort of catch up. I mean, there's a story, uh, there's a story um, about Jared Kushner's father, Charlie, and how he ended up in prison. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll ask you to do it quick, quickly, but also, you know, give all the good details and, you know, maybe leave a little for people to, you know, read in your book. So Jared Kushner's father, Charles Kushner, uh, is also a real estate developer in New Jersey. It kind of Trumpian in the sense that he, um, you know, acquires and sells a lot of properties and takes on a lot of debt. He does build, but, you know, there's more to his business. It's a lot of acquisition. And he begins in the sort of, mm, in the 1980s to get involved in sort of charitable giving and then politics, and he starts to give to politicians. And then he sort of becomes intoxicated with the sort of sense of power and access he has over political leaders. So he uh, starts to cross lines and he starts to make donations in other people's names, which you're not allowed to do, uh, and he gets caught. And he is, first of all, he is sued by his brother Murray, uh, who is so Joe Kushner, the builder, has put a lot of his wealth into different trusts and uh, set up these complex business relationships so that Murray and Charles, his sons, can't really separate themselves. So if Charlie does something with the business, he's doing it for Murray too. And Murray gets angry because he feels like it's against the law and they're both lawyers and there's a family split. And Murray sues, sues Charlie and the US attorney for New Jersey, one Christopher J. Christie, catches wind of the civil lawsuit and starts investigating and in fact, finds very serious crimes, tax evasion. He finds that Charlie Kushner is uh, spending essentially taxpayer money on personal things, on speeches, on landscaping, on liquor. Uh, and this is sort of a straight up tax evasion suit. And while he's investigating it, um, 
Charlie Kushner decides that his sister Esther and his brother Murray are conspiring against him. Esther is named after his mother Ray's sister, the one who ran in different directions and didn't survive the Nazis. And Charlie hires a sex worker to entrap her husband, his sister's husband, Billy. And then and he has the whole thing videotaped. And he sort of sits on it for a while. And then it becomes clear that Chris Christie's uh, prosecution is coming to a conclusion. And on the eve of his nephew Jacob's engagement party, he sends the tape to his sister. And she takes it to the Christie's office. And they pretty quickly arrest Charlie Kushner now for witness tampering, along with tax evasion and campaign finance violations. And uh, they, he is going to fight it, but then they decide to, he decides to plead guilty. I'll let people read the book to find out why he decides to plead guilty, but he pleads yeah. guilty. He goes to yeah. prison. There's some, more, there's some more good stuff in there for sure. There is a family <laughs> narrative of resentment that develops yeah. that is passed from yeah. Charlie to yeah. Jared. And, right. and that's what's interesting and important. And I want you to sort of spell that out is sort of what, again, we're thinking about how do you take a thing that's happened to your family? And then how do you tell your, how do you tell yourself the story? How does Jared Kushner tell himself the story of what happened to his father? And what does that tell us about Jared Kushner? Right. So from Charlie and Jared's point of view, um, his uncle and aunt were informants and were cooperating with the government, were just jealous. Charlie Kushner was making all kinds of money for them. They were ungrateful. Uh, at one point, he told, Jared told Chris Christie uh, that this was a matter that should have been settled by the rabbis or the family, not by prosecutors. This was years later in the 2016 campaign. And I will tell you that, so I got this anecdote from Chris Christie's book, but since I had covered Chris Christie, I felt like I had to corroborate that. Sure. So I had to speak to several people around Christie to find out if he actually told that story in real time versus just in his book. Uh -huh. um, but what happens is Jared Kushner has this lingering resentment towards Chris Christie and Chris Christie is Trump's transition chief in 2016 and over Jared's objections. And then after Trump wins, Jared has Christie fired. And all of us are suffering the consequences of that because having this transition process as a federal law that's supposed to protect national security. Right. You're supposed to have better vetting. You're supposed to know who you're hiring in the cabinet. You're supposed to make sure Russian bankers aren't coming in and offering you things. And because the transition is just completely, literally thrown in a dumpster, all the binders, 30 or so binders are thrown in a dumpster, uh, the nation is put at risk by this family feud between <laughs> Jared and Charlie Kushner and Chris Christie. Right, and it's also like, again, this idea of we didn't do anything wrong. They did something wrong. Mm -hmm. We got to protect ourselves. They were coming for my father. They went way too far. You know, what's a, a, there's like a quote where he's like, it's a tape. Like, you know, mm -hmm. he's just, you know, okay, maybe sending the tape was wrong, but like, yeah. it's a tape of your uncle. Yeah with yeah. someone who your father paid to have sex with. You know I mean? It's just like this, it's, it, that's the most striking thing to me, right? It's just this like, you're, you did wrong. I didn't do wrong. You know, you guys were the ones who wronged us. And yeah, not, and yeah. I think that that, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it creates an administration that is uniquely unreceptive to constructive criticism. Yeah. Because every time you have something to say, it's because you're a hater or you have an agenda or you're out to get them. It's yeah. not because you might have a legitimate point. And right. that is very sadly the world we live in where it's sort of not what's the truth, but what's the angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is of course the person, you know, in charge of like foreign policy in places like, oh, I don't know, the Middle East. Yeah, Middle East, yes. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that I think is really important to understand for Jared Kushner, I think people got a you know sort of glimpse of this earlier on in the coronavirus crisis is that, you know, he's, um, a kind of behind the scenes guy. He doesn't really speak publicly that often. Um, I mean, he does somewhat, but he is the most powerful person in the White House, not named Trump. And he cannot be fired. He has outlasted 
three chiefs of staff, two secretaries of state, an attorney general, just on and on and on. All these people have come and gone, and he is still there. And because he is family to Trump, he can interact with him in the West Wing, which is where the official stuff happens, and in the East Wing, which is where the family is, if Trump wants to have dinner with his grandchildren, Jared Kushner is there. And also Jared Kushner is the person in the White House who's the point person for the campaign. So he is an right. immensely powerful person yeah. uh, and who was sort of carrying around all of this sort of resentment narratives. And so it's really important to understand who he is. Mm -hmm. And reading this book really helps do that. Yeah. Let me just say like out loud, it's fascinating. So I'm going to, you know, fast forward through a lot, like, you know, the next phase after, you know, after and during The Apprentice, of course, is when um, the Trump family is mostly making its making its money by licensing its name. I mean, they're not building anything anymore. They're just basically like selling people the right to use their name on certain buildings. And of course, this is where when he starts to get involved in, uh, let's say, working with uh, foreign investors, he starts to get yeah, yeah <laughs> interested in Russia. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the people that he's doing licensing deals, as you know, are like, you know, countries that are suspect. Right. Panama. Right. Azerbaijan. Georgia. Yeah. You know, just places where um, Philippines that are really in India, you know, they have high corruption indexes. So that is where he is doing his business. There's not a Trump Tower Paris and a Trump Tower London. That's and right. his big, big goal was always a Trump Tower Moscow. Moscow, right. And of course, the Russia saga um, mm -hmm. that everyone knows so much about. Um, you know, one question I was going to ask you about just about that. Um, and again, people should definitely read your book to get some of the good nitty gritty on it. But, you know, what did you learn from the, the Russia saga, the Mueller investigation, the sort of, you know, um, ended with a whimper, not a bang ending of that whole thing. What do you feel like people still need to know about that? I mean, it was, okay, so what happened in 2016 and you right. know, appears to still be going on now yep. is terrible. And I think that, you know, one of the things I did this summer was read the 900 page bipartisan Senate intelligence report, volume five, uh, which was on Russian interference in 2016 election. Right. And what became so apparent to me is that it wasn't just that the election was interfered with, which it was. I mean, we know this. We know that when Donald Trump Jr. was told the Russians are going to help you, he was like, I love it. Like, I mean, that happened. And we know Trump was like, yeah, sure. Foreign governments have something. I want to know it. I mean, he's, you know, just this week, there was this uh, effort to keep from publicizing this New York Post story, which came through Rudy Giuliani, who has apparently US intelligence has concluded a Russian intelligence target or conduit, that it's a way for the Kremlin to get information to president is through his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani. I mean, this is, you know, just yesterday, this story broke. So I think one of the incredibly important things to understand is that it's still going on and that what happened wasn't just a thing, but it's part of an ongoing process. And part of the process has been the Kremlin spreading information through various US government sources and you know, sort of essentially what are propaganda outlets that act as its own um, sort of, that act as like the counter narrative to the Russia narrative. So it's not only that they did this thing, but then they're using maximizing U.S. information systems to dismiss their own really nefarious actions. So, I mean, it is serious. It's dramatic, and um, it is ongoing, is what you, you know, were saying. And there's a story, uh, yeah. you know, in the Mueller report about how uh, Putin sends a banker to meet with Jared Kushner, who has gone to the trouble to research. Jared Kushner's family story in Poland. And when Jared Kushner was interviewed about it, he said, oh, I was so uninterested in him, I didn't even Google him. And that is the kind of information asymmetry that our government has been operating under, was then, and from what we can tell, still is. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if there's anything anyone listening takes away from this, it is still ongoing. It didn't end just when, you know, the Mueller investigation didn't result in some kind of massive impeachment. All right. I'm going to ask you two more questions and then I promise we'll um, go get to other people's questions. One thing is, you know, you mentioned the New York Times report. Um, New York Times, of course, now has um, Trump's tax returns and we know. Good some, for them. Yes. We know some of the big takeaways, $750 one year he paid in taxes. He's obviously not as wealthy as he says he is. What surprised you the most as someone, you are such a Trump watcher and you've been so deep in these documents and this reporting. Yeah, I mean, I think what the story crystallized was the financial stake that Trump has in re-election. So he has these hundreds of millions of dollars in debt and the debt comes due and he, that he is personally guaranteed. I mean, he actually has more debt than that, but he has that amount that he is personally guaranteed. And it comes due during a potential second term. So if he is in office, he has all kinds of tools to put off the payment of debt. Because what would you do if you were a banker? Would you default the president of the United States who controls macro and microeconomic policy and could really mess up things for your bank? If you do, that's bad. If you don't, you're giving a huge gift to the president of the United States. I mean, there's just no good way out. Wow. And that really crystallized for me. And then the other thing that, you know, he has this $100 million tax dispute, $100 million tax dispute with the IRS. And, you know, we look at the way he is, he basically thinks all federal agencies are his agencies, the Justice Department is his lawyer, the generals are his general, uh, the Customs and Border Control belongs to him, he can tell them whatever he wants. There's no reason to think he's not, he wouldn't be that way with the IRS in settling his own personal tax dispute. So the financial stake, it's not just about power and prestige and the usual things that presidents want, uh, that Trump wants a lot. It's also about money for Trump. That is a really, really important takeaway. And I'm so glad you said that. And I think it's a thing that people don't really know. Um, I think one question that's on a lot of people's mind is if he doesn't win the election, What's the likelihood that he himself will be charged or indicted with a crime? Or multiple yeah, crimes? so I have, you know, I mean, I've been really thinking about this a lot, and I have been covering very, you know, all the blow by blows of the Trump v. Vance tax cakes, uh, right. which, as you know, because you covered and I covered, I mean, you know, Cy Vance, who's the Manhattan District Attorney, had an opportunity to indict Donald Trump's adult children, instead, overrules his own prosecutors after a visit for, from a Trump donor. But yep. that is another story. Yep. The story that's happening now is that he try, is trying to investigate Trump's taxes and Trump has refused to turn them over. And he just keeps, he has a lawyer, Will Consovoy, who keeps making these pretty insane arguments and he keeps losing and then he appeals to the next court and he appeals to the next court and he appeals to the next court. And it's so Trumpian because it's just about winning the clock. It's about running out the clock and it's sort of using the system against itself. Trump knows that the courts are going to have to go through the procedures and motions and briefing schedules, and it's all going to take a long time. He doesn't care about that. Uh, but he would only run out the clock for this election, not forever. And we are now, the case has now gone up to the Supreme Court for the second time, and we could get a ruling next week on whether Trump has to turn over his tax return to the DA. And it looks from what constitutional scholars tell me that the court will not hear the case again, which means that Trump will have to turn over his tax return to the DA. And there's nothing, really will, he, yeah, I mean, there's will. no pardon that can overcome that. So right. if the DA this time decides to indict, uh, it doesn't look like Trump could stop it reelected or not reelected. Hmm. Uh, that this local prosecution would go through. There's also a separate prosecution, or not a prosecution, but a civil investigation by the New York Attorney General into whether Trump underpaid his taxes, his New York taxes. And, uh, you know, there's pretty strong evidence already out in the public record that he did. Right. So um, those investigations likely will continue to go forward. Uh, so there will be some kind of reckoning. Do you feel like you're going to be thinking about this guy for a really long time? <laughs> Did you ever think you were going to spend this much of your life no. about a guy like this? No, I mean, and I, and I, you know, I do think that this question of the reckoning is something that, you know, post voting day uh, is something I'm going to really be thinking about because 
what is the right thing to do? I don't know. And, uh, you know, there's all these congressional investigations and, you know, there'll be a new Congress, but, you know, there's a really sort of ongoing debate. Should Congress investigate or should they move on? Like, should they put Trump behind and take care of other things? Right. And there, there are arguments, there are legit arguments on both sides. I mean, there's an argument, okay, yes, you should move on. And then there's an argument without an adequate reckoning, right. society gets corroded. Right. And I think there's a real argument to be made that after the financial crisis, when there wasn't a serious reckoning and when the attitude of the Obama administration seemed to be, let's move on, right. that there was a sense in the body politic that the system is rigged. Yep. And I think that is a lot what led to Trump's election last time in 2016. Like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Okay, I we have hit our time. I'm going to turn it back <laughs> over to the other Andrea. Thank you so 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 much for answering me. Kelly, questions. it is I could, really I great could to talk to you. Thank you so you much. Ever, I have so many questions. Um, but Andrea, I want to just make sure, mm -hmm. other Andrea, that we're doing what we said we would do. And if anybody else's questions need to get in here, wait. The uh, Andrea Bernstein is the other Andrea. <laughs> anyway, okay, I have so many questions for you, and I'm, but there are two that I want you to take because they're so good. Uh, the first one is the reports that Trump's children harbor presidential and dynastic aspirations for 2024. How much truth is there to this, do you think? This is to both of you who are Trump scholars. Um, Not me. So. <laughs> I mean, I think that, okay, so two things have gone on. I think that um, Don Jr. has really become a very political person and sort of a darling of kind of conservative speech making. He does a lot of, uh, he speaks at colleges and he goes around the country. Um, but as polarizing as Donald J. Trump is, Donald J. Trump Jr., nth degree, so much more so. So I think it's difficult. The Trump that um, acts, like they might run for office sometime is Ivanka Trump. Ivanka Trump is in every way like her father, except totally disciplined. So her relationship to truth is the same. Her relationship into sort of into family stories is the same. Yes. Uh, but she understands how to stay on message and to create an image. And she spent a lot of time uh, as White House senior advisor, sort of putting herself in crowds of women and people of color and talking about the economic message of the administration. Uh, I don't know if she wants to run for office, but she is, to me, acting like somebody who is leaving that option open. Um, okay, here's another one. These people, meaning the Kushners and the Trumps, are liars. The press used words like falsehood or untruth instead of calling a lie a lie. Why is that? Why don't that? Why doesn't the New York yeah. Times, for example, just say he's a liar or he lied? I think that's changed. I think that um, there's been um, a lot more sort of candor uh, about what it is that Trump's doing. Uh, and, I, and I think that was actually a conscious decision from what I understand. I mean, I don't work for the New York Times, but um, I do see a lot more headlines that say Trump said this, it's wrong. Trump said this, it's not true. There's a lot of fact checking that's going on. And uh, the Washington Post fact checker at last count, so this was July, uh, had counted 2,000, uh, 20,000. No. 20,000 Trump lies while he's yeah. in office. And I know 2,000 would be a lot, but 20,000 is, is what yeah. it is. But I recently contacted him and I said, you know, I cite that number all the time. Do you have an update? That was from July. And he said, we are so busy sort of fact checking everything and calling out them that we haven't had a chance to redo our tally. Like tally. So wow. I think it's gotten better. And I think, you know, to those who watched the town hall with Savannah Guthrie last night, like she was quite clear about like calling him out and challenging him in a way that people were definitely not in 2016. Yeah. And we're not at the beginning of his presidency. And I'll just say that I've heard editors explain it um, in this way, which is to say lie implies intent. When you say it's false or it's untrue, that's a thing that you can prove. You can't prove that the person had the intention to lie. That's the uh, distinction mm -hmm. I've heard from editors. I'm not gonna comment on whether or not I agree with it. Um, but my big thing that I've been like waving my hands and screaming about since 2015 is if, it, if you know it's false, 
mm-hmm. then, you know, this, this thing we do on the radio is very different than in print, then don't play the tape. Don't yeah. play the tape of someone saying something false and then right after it say, oh, but by the way, that's not true. It's like, then don't play, if you know it's not true, don't repeat it. I mean, that's part, I mean, we all know that that's been part of the problem is that just the constant replaying of the lies, the propagation of the lies is part of the problem. And, and we are- Yeah. I mean, one of the things I really grappled with my book, not just from Trump, but you know, all the other oligarchs that I wrote about and heard from, was um, when you know that somebody's denial is false, how do you handle it? And it's something I really sort of, you know, wrestled with and really thought about each time I wanted to represent somebody's views, but also if somebody was going to say something was a straight out lie, I would be dishonest with my readers right. if I didn't somehow contextualize it so people understood that. Yeah. Uh, and it was something, as a matter of fact, I went and um, I consulted with Masha Gessen, who has written a number of biographies of Putin, to say, well, how did you handle this? It was Putin. You knew it was lying. And you know, what Masha said is actually in Russia is kind of easy. It's easier because everybody knew everything they said was a, was a lie and there was no right. tradition of having to go back and ask. Yes, uh, right. You don't so, have to go back and like right. get the comment from the right, from the Kremlin. <laughs> yes. You know it's already lying. Yeah, I mean, right. in a way. And we know that the lies are rampant in this administration too. So maybe that culture will change too. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for showing up today and I and Andrea and Kelly thank you so much um I urge everyone to go onto the website so that you can get a link to um Andrea's book American Oligarchs she has thank you my my (laughs) she has uh signed book plates so order order your books and you'll get a yes uh, yes I have you can it's like just like a virtual book signing I signed them all <laughs> yeah and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually get a book plate too to go in mine <laughs> I'm so excited anyway um thank you again all of you who you know in the audience see you soon thanks for coming and we'll thank see you, you next so much. week on okay great thanks for hosting well, me again and thank you Kelly yes Welcome. thank you Kelly thank you, thank you Andrea bye-bye, bye-bye.